Good evening, everybody. Yeah, it's uh, Paul Griffiths here, and it's live and uncut. And welcome. Thanks for joining me this evening. My guest is Dade Freeman. Dade, welcome to my show. Hello, Paul. How you doing? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Um, just before we go any further, we've got a little bit of connection problem. We just as the voice goes a little bit from time to time from both ends. So my apologies for that. But it always seems to work out in the YouTube when you watch it at a later date. So if you miss anything in the in the live show, watch the YouTube later on Photography Life and Uncut on YouTube. And uh, so we get that sorted out as we go along. It should settle down, but uh, it, that's that's just the way the context uh, con connection goes these days. Um, Dade, as I say, thanks so much for joining me. We met a couple of months ago, in actual fact, uh, when we did a walkabout down in uh, in Brighton. It was really great to see you down there. Such a hot day. It was ridiculous, wasn't it? It was. Absolutely it was great. Ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it was absolutely stupid hot. The only sunny day of the year, I reckon. But anyway, Dave, what I want to do is let's let's take you right back. Okay. The question I always ask my guests: What was the first camera in your household? Uh, you to be honest, I genuinely don't know. I know we had one. Um, I don't know what it was. I know that we would take it along. We was on holidays. We typically go to Barmouth in Wales. Um, we take a bunch of snaps. So I wouldn't, but my mum and dad would. Um, yeah. And then they get back home and they'd send them off to be processed and they get back a bunch of blurry, dark, overexposed thumbs on them, a bunch of images that were no good at all, actually. So yeah. my first recollection of a camera was not a good one. <laughs> do you know that's exactly what my dad used to do? Yeah, I bought him a beautiful Olympus trip and some other cameras. And I was looking at them only a few weeks ago, actually, and uh, they were all blurred. I thought, what's, what's going on? we don't get that anymore because we've got digital yeah. now and we've got autofocus so what was the first camera that you bought yourself for yourself um the first camera i bought was the lumix i think it was i think it was the lumix um, it wasn't great it was just entry level yeah um, and the reason i bought it um not because i wanted to be a photographer um, i was working out in spain um, I had quite an interesting job there. I was the master of ceremonies, which is a great title. Um, <laughs> what it basically was, my role, was to help Spaniards speak English in a right. non-classroom environment. So there were EMPs, very important people. There were CEOs. There were a very diverse range of people who needed to speak English, but needed to do so in a way that wasn't formulaic, the classroom typically was um, and it was very relaxed so I would have mm -hmm. to teach them how to be confident with the English language I'd have to teach them how to use English how to communicate without words um, which was always fun so we do things like karaoke we do acting classes we do singing we do mime whatever it needed to actually bring the confidence out in these people and the reason for the camera which we get to now yeah. um, was because we were there for a week. It was a week solid, intense English class, but we do so much diverse work that we would need to capture it, or I wanted to capture it, to actually yeah. show them at the end of it, this is where you were, and this is where you are, and look at all the things we did in between. So the idea was to go buy a camera and capture these, and at the end of the week, I'd create a slideshow using um, iPhoto, um, use an oh, iPhone okay. back then, um, load them all into iPhoto, create this little slideshow. They get to see what they'd done and all this great work they'd achieved. And that's where the camera came in. And I quickly, I'd been doing that job for three or four years. And about halfway through, I changed from the Lumix because I dropped it, it got smashed, and bought a Canon Rebel, the 450D. Okay. Right, okay. 450D, I would say, was my first professional camera. Um, and that pretty much held me up for a year, uh, for two years after that, and then one year when I'd actually came back to the UK and started my career as a photographer. So the 450D, okay. I would say, was my first official camera. Official camera, but the, 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 the little starter was the Lumix. So there's quite a bit of a spread there. Did You, did, you had no real interest in photography no. Nope. Um, as, as a young as a young kid at school oh. or college, nothing at all. No, nope. it was just a fake. Basically, I'm sorry, I want to say yes. Because no, I, it, 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 
he come out taking pictures perfectly, of course. But yeah, it's nice to hear <laughs> someone didn't do that route. It's, it's, it's such a such a what a change, you know, a revelation. Well, we got a guy who had no interest in photography until how old would you have been? About mid twenties, I'm guessing. Oh, dude, you flatter me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I try. Um, no, it, it was really recent. Um, I've only been doing photography, um, I'd say properly. Um, this is my fifth year. Right. Okay. Five years. So let's let's nail it down. Why why did we or how did we get into photography? Um, in, well, in this in, form, the job in Spain um, that I referred to, um, the economy, as you know, it all went crash. Um, so it kind of dried up. It disappeared. Yeah. Um, and as a consequence, people didn't have a training budget and so on and so forth. So I then needed to come back to the UK to work. And I, as I say, I bought this 450D and I'd actually enjoyed photographing, you know, doing photography. Um, and I'd started whilst I was out there teaching myself, okay, what is manual and how do I get this thing called depth of field? And if I slow the shutter speed down, what happens? And I'd been learning myself this whole idea of the, the nuances of what we actually do as photographers. Um, so from there, I then turned around and said, okay, um, I can do this. I understand how to get a sharp picture. I understand how to get motion blur. I understand what depth of field is. I can probably do this. So I contacted a friend who was here and he worked for Epson and he was also getting into photography. So we were at the same level, um, but he was technically, he was brilliant. He was the person who, before he even took the camera out of the box, he read the manual backwards. Right, okay. Um, it One just of those guys, yeah. I got the manual, threw that away because, hey, that away, exactly. Get rid of that. Um, and I started doing all these creative things with a camera, but not knowing how. So if he said, okay, do that again, I was like, I don't I know. I, just can't, I, I did that, and then that happened, and then this. And I didn't know why it was happening, but I knew how to do it. Mm. So we came at it from two different perspectives, which was really good. Um, he was very technical, I was very creative. So in terms of that, we then created this wedding little business enterprise because why not everyone does yeah um, so we then started doing weddings um, and as I say I do the more arty shots and he'd do the more formulaic um, and it worked because of the way we were but it's like one of those things you kind of outgrow yourselves and each other his path went one way my path went the other um, and I found that I was more interested in creating portraiture than I was doing the weddings I enjoy the weddings but it yep. wasn't, I didn't want to go out and compete. Um, I found that we were at, when we found clients, we were being asked for more and more for less and less. Yeah. You know what I mean by that? It was more images, more of this for less money. And it was just like, guys, we can't do this. This doesn't work. So I made the decision that for me, I was kind of out of the wedding game. Um, I do it as a second shooter. If you want to go and find the work and bring the people in, I'll happily do the arty shots and the creative stuff and work alongside you to get the best that we can from this time. Um, but I don't want to be out there having this. Um, you don't want to be the front man doing the doing the the selling basically, and knowing that each time your customer's like, going to be wanting to knock you down on price. Yeah, it felt like a battle, and I just didn't yeah. want to do that. I, I wanted to enjoy what I was doing, um, yeah. rather than feel that I was having to compete constantly for every image in every dime it just seemed pointless well i, I know uh, our friend michael Rommel has uh, had gone through exactly the same process and i remember um one of the walkabouts uh, we we bumped into a guy who was uh, uh who, who was moving into wedding photography and and really had got into the doldrums as regards to getting work on a regular basis yeah until someone turned around and said double your price and see what happens he doubled his price and really stuck hard to it and said it's not going to be 500 pound anymore a day it's going to be a thousand pound a day and he's he's work doubled uh, on the back of that but it yeah. is it's a tough decision to make you know some guys have got the front basically to say no that's what i'm going to do but you've got to be it really to a degree i could never do wedding photography i couldn't it would scare the living daylights out of me but you've got to be so dedicated and committed to doing that type of work yeah um yeah. and um those that do uh you know and and make those changes and moves uh invariably uh can make a good living out of it yeah and i think if you commit yourself and your time to actually learning the craft of wedding photography you can do amazing yeah, work. Um, yeah. but i think you've got to decide is that why you want to put all your eggs into that one basket and keep going yeah. at that? 
or do you want to do something a bit more diverse photography you know it's, it's like I did magic for a while because I'm magic you can go into any genre of magic and illusions and hypnotherapy and all sorts of other stuff and um, with photography you could be a food photographer or a wedding or portraits or animals and I like the fact that it was is quite so diverse but I quickly learned that don't really want to do pets and animals don't really want to do that, no, but do that. It's not really my thing right. I want to stay away from that if possible kind of the family portraiture I've shot and I'll do it but it's not really where I prefer I like the one-on-one -on -one. yeah I like being able to converse with someone um, to bring out the character of them and to actually get to know them whereas when it's a family dynamic it's quite hard you're having to compete with different personalities you're having to try and get everyone on the same page which isn't always possible no that's true so I, I find that one slightly more challenging um, and I think as I was saying in the previous part when we were chatting offline we're saying yeah. landscape photography landscape photography it's great I see the vistas but I don't know how to capture it but if you put a lighthouse there I've now got one subject in that landscape I can now photograph that I can kind yeah, of connect really. with that one subject but when it comes to a group of subjects I do find that more challenging yeah so uh, interesting you mentioned that because there's a particular part of your portfolio on the website which we're going to look at very shortly where you've got uh, where you do your fine art photography of architecture and of uh, uh, mono architecture uh, shots which uh, I, I really enjoy looking at how did that particular part of your work uh, develop um that kind of came about again it was one of them it just happens. Um, I, again, I've explored all these genres of photography and explored them quite extensively. Um, and the architecture, I hadn't dived into too much. I'd gone and taken snaps of buildings, um, but I ended up getting a client in Hong Kong, um, and he is an, an architect client. And he said, okay, we're building this um, new block of flats. We need you to go and shoot lifestyle stuff of the area shows what schools okay. are there what the cafes are like etc etc so i did the lifestyle stuff then it was photographing the plot of land that the building's going to be built upon so they could do the cgis um, yep. and it was okay we've got a building that we want you to go and photograph that we've built and so on and so on and so on so i had to learn how to photograph buildings and architecture um, so i figured well okay if i can do this what else can I do with this? Because I'm kind of liking this. It's quiet. It's simple. It's yep. as I simple as, as anything is in photography. It's it's yeah. simple if you can take the time to learn it. Um, but I went out and I, I looked at the kind of photography that I would like to photograph. I was photographing buildings rather than just here's Brian Pavilion snap. It was like, okay, here's Brian Pavilion, but how can I shoot this in a way that's different? How can I shoot this in a way that yeah hasn't been seen and I stumbled across a guy called Joel Chinchilla thank you um, <laughs> and his work was amazing it just blew my yeah. mind like, okay Quite this agree. is impressive no one I know is doing this on this side at least in Brighton area so let's hear yeah. what I can do with that um, it kind of works better if you've got metallic and glass buildings Yes, I tried doing it on the Victorian stuff, and it doesn't work quite as well. It does need the reflective elements that those buildings give um, for it to work perfectly. Um, but I explored that, and I went out to Berlin. As I say, this client has property all over the world, so he sent me out to Berlin to photograph. And I figured, whilst I'm here, there's a lot of shiny buildings. So yeah, exactly. I can create. So I went and I created this stuff whilst I was there. And when I got back, I edited it um, the way I thought. Joel did it because I didn't know his process. No, I kind of liked what I was producing, so I worked on it and I finessed it. And then they produced a PDF um, that I got hold of, and I was happy to see how they did it. And I was like, oh, okay, so he does that, not this. So it helped yeah. me find my process a little bit more. Um, and I didn't want to replicate exactly what he does. Go to the same location, shoot the same thing, edit. Because no, the no. then I'm just producing Joel's work. Yeah, exactly. Right. I don't see the point in doing that. So no. what I did is taken the idea of what he was doing and then said, okay, let's see what I can do with it. So I've yeah. explored Brighton quite a bit and I've explored a little bit of London, um, but I'm going to do probably a day where I just hit it really hard. Yeah. Um, but I remember going out and photographing a couple of times in London and security is quite tight, unnecessarily so. Um, but they, they happily come out. When you stick a tripod up, 
the security guards happily come over and oh what are you doing the security purposes and blah yeah. and it's like dude I'm photographing the top of your building pretty much. I'm not looking at the entrances. There's no security. This is not a threat. Um, but unfortunately, you've got to contend with these issues. Um, and as long as you can do it and you smile. Um, the one thing I did for some guys in Manchester was I actually showed my portfolio. And I went, oh, I'll just show you my phone, what I've got. So I showed him my work. Very good idea. And he was just blown away. He's like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Oh, if you're doing that then that's fine, but don't let anyone else know. Like, no, exactly. Hey, interesting you say that, actually, because I was talking to some friends uh, when we were on a walkabout, and they're saying, can't do street portraiture. I find it embarrassing going up to people and asking them. So I said, well, I, I didn't have it at the time. I said, look, I, I've in actual fact created a book of uh, 100 street portraits, you know, people that total strangers. And I said, really, if you have this problem, just get this book out and just say, look, this is the work I'm doing. I just wanted to be part of a portfolio. And you're doing the same with your fine art there, which is a great idea, really. And yeah. again, interestingly enough, only last night I made a, a little presentation at my camera club on projects. And one of the projects was buying yourself a little notebook type thing with a sketch paper in and just doing some little seven, six by four prints and putting them in. Uh, and it's a good record to have. And if you can have it in your bag, you can show they, people they what you've done. Squarespace is they give you a, a, a mobile portfolio. And it's fantastic because yeah. instantly yeah. everywhere you go, you just pull it out, show Very people, true. and it totally disarmed yeah. him. Um, and when he saw yeah. the work, he was just like, "Oh, okay, yeah, fine. There's no yeah, problem." Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It does. And then, interestingly enough, there's this fallacy about taking photographs in London. It's all about where you're actually taking the photograph from, and obviously where you're putting the tripod down. And yeah. this still bugs me to this day. I don't know what the problem is with tripods, apart from safety, health, and safety. Obviously, if you're on a busy street, but you know, if you're not actually on their property, you can take a photograph wherever you like. Um, and I think if you challenge them and say, well, call the police, nine times out of 10, they say, well, we won't bother, but just don't, you know, it's all that. It's annoying that it carries on so much. But, it, is. Um, it is, and it does get in the way. And it, and it kind of, you, you need to be in a certain mindset to do what we do. Yeah, you do. Um, and the minute that's yeah. taken away, I think it just crushes everything. Yeah. You use, you use your enthusiasm. You're then in a bad mood and it reflects in your work. And you don't yeah. like what you take at the end. No, and I think that's a shame because if they understood that the architect went to an amazing degree to create this building that you see in front of you, he did that because he wanted people to look at it. Exactly what right. What we're doing is immortalizing it through the photography. How is that? Yeah. I don't understand. I genuinely don't understand how that. No, I don't either. And and thank God the uh, European uh, Parliament didn't push that panoramic bill through as well. Which I was when I saw it, I thought, here we go. This is going to. Well, I did write a blog on it. Basically, I said, okay, you're going to kill photography. You kill history. Yeah. Because basically, you won't have any record of any street activity anywhere in the world. I don't think you can actually do street photography in Budapest anymore. I think they've actually banned that. I was going to say, they've changed it a lot in, in several different countries. France has quite a strict yeah. thing on it, and I know somewhere in Asia it may be... So oh, is, it, um, is it Thailand? No, it's not Thailand. Yeah. You can still shoot in Thailand. It may yeah. be Singapore, but yeah. it's anywhere where anyone is in the shot, even in the background. That's right. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's like, guys, it I don't understand. I, I get the, the need for privacy and personal space, but I, I, I think they're doing the whole industry a disservice by putting in pointless restrictions, personally. And the other thing is, though, Dave, you know, you know for a fact, if you were just walking down the street and you got your iPhone out, took a photograph of the, of the building, the guy probably wouldn't have even bat an eyelid. Oh, no, well, that's okay. That's acceptable. It's also exactly, acceptable yeah. for their CCTV to watch us everywhere we go and everything. That's and the other thing, yeah. With that, but yeah. Like, well, there's, there's no point getting into these arguments because they don't want to hear it. It's, it's no, you're, well, no, they don't. No, they're, they're, they're just get your portfolio yeah. and say, This is what I photograph. If you would like me to photograph your building in that style, Leave me alone and I'll be good. Yeah. If not, I'll go and photograph somebody else's building. It's just... Yeah, easy. I tell you, that's a very good idea, actually. I, I think uh, I'll certainly do that because I like taking the odd architectural shots. I'll tell you what we'll do, Dave. Let's go straight to uh, screen share uh, okay. because I will start on... Um, you're going to get my site up quickly because I've got to uh, switch it over um, after, just prior to the show. So just bear with me a second while I okay. get back to my site and get you on there. Um, 
I want to go through your front page uh, 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 later on, if you don't mind, because uh, what I want to do is show the viewers the fine artwork, uh, which we've just been talking about, okay. um, which is the uh, the photographs. If I click on each one, can you? Do they go? Yes, they do. Um, if you click on the images, I think that's, that should be better. Yeah. That now come up in a full screen. Yeah, loading up. It's not normally that slow. No, it's, I think here we go. Wow, that's slow. Styles. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Okay, we won't waste time on that. We'll go straight back to the prints, because really, not that slow. Um, I it. What what we're seeing here is, as you said, a a a, a style of photography which is. And I'm really, really excited about this style because it's something which I just love to see. Uh, Joel Chinchilla, as you mentioned, is is now, dare I use the term, world-renowned for this type of work. And uh, another uh, friend of mine who I've had on the show, Tuan Nguyen, as well, photographs very similar type work to this as well now. And the other person who I've had on my show, is lovely to talk to, is Irene Kuhn uh, from Switzerland. And... Uh, she originally was an artist okay and she basically was told by a, an art gallery owner why don't you photograph the way you paint and she just couldn't believe it she went out and bought herself a Hasselblad and these are the type of photographs that she takes but she has a tendency to go more with the the old styled um, buildings so she did a very a great uh, portfolio of the buildings in Rome uh, oh, all good. along this high contrast style and I just love it. I just think this is great. You've got some beautiful straight line edges here and curves of the building. Well, as you can see, it's all about the contrast. Yes. Um, and as you say, that, that glass and the metal work work really well for this type of photography. Yeah. As I say, I've tried it on more traditional buildings, and they just don't have the same appeal. There's something yeah. about this look that just works. Um, as you can see, these shots are all over. There's some Brighton. There's the uh, Delaware there. There's some from Manchester. The first one. I saw the, uh, the the Hilton, the Manchester here. This one on the right, yeah. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, that one there. I know that one quite well. And at the oh, bottom there, there's some I tried. Slightly different. This was my early, as you can see, it's quite a different style, but in the yep. same genre. Um, and yes. what I tried to do is take that look and, and take it a little bit further. And as time yeah. went on, this West Pier and Marina that you see at the beginning here, um, yes. that finessed as time went on. I bought myself yeah. a proper leaf filter. I bought myself a 16 stop. And it's all helped because you want the movement in the clouds and you need exactly, yeah. longer and longer exposures in order to get that. Yeah, I was going to ask you what filter you had on there. So obviously, it is uh, an ND filter, a, a, a long, a long stopper, ten stopper. But you say you're using stop and six stopper, so yeah, sixteen stopper. Yeah. yeah. And then on the odd occasion, there's ones where I've just switched out skies and made them more interesting. Yeah. See that one with a streak. This um, one. Um, no, if you come down, uh, that's the one there that you're just on the Berlin buildings. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's been black skied because it was a bright day yeah sure we put in um but again this for me is art so i don't have an issue yes. being it doesn't need to represent a true representation of what the building is it no. needs to represent what i want it to and what i see within the building um and from here it's about the shadow and the highlights and the contrast and yep so I, I have no issue switching skies and doing anything. The building's still the building. I haven't liquefied it or manipulated it. No. But I have chose my angles as carefully as I could to give the best effect, and I have tried to bring out the most that I can from the building, whether that's pushing the highlights or pulling the shadows. Let's just look at this Tetris building here. For argument's sake, how many different images of that particular uh, mm. building would you have taken in that time? Um, whilst I was there, that was on a commission job, so it had to be done quickly. Uh, yeah. I probably photographed 12 iterations of that made, okay. yeah. um, and that's the one that I choose. Again, when it comes to photography, I think your job is to edit, and you have to edit quite strictly with yourself. And there is 
12, they're okay images, they're good, they're nothing wrong with them, um, but I'm looking for the best image that I can. Yeah. Um, so I had a straight on, I had one coming at an angle, and this was the angle I chose because I thought it was more dynamic. Yeah, I quite agree with you. Um, and it's, shown, straight up, yeah. it's shown plenty of the building and the shape of it and all the rest of it. Um, so this yeah. was the shot that I chose. The other 10 or 11, they're probably sitting on my computer and haven't been touched. Didn't, didn't quite, didn't quite uh, hack it for you. No. But, uh, let's go to the showcase, uh, Dave, because we want to talk really about your um, your main portfolio here of, of work, of, uh, of your portrait work and fashion work. Um, tell me about this image here. Is this uh, commissioned work or? Uh, this was literally photographed weekend just gone on Saturday. Uh, right. The person inside that stormtrooper helmet was a five-year-old boy. <laughs> but, but he was like a mini stormtrooper. He's fantastic. Um, and there was supposed to be. It was at the costume games in Brighton. Um, where I'm with you. Cosplay and Comic Con type people turn up. Um, and they come in costume, most of them. Um, and we were expecting a lot of stormtroopers to actually show up, and they didn't. Um, in fact, all we had was this little pint-sized stormtrooper. <laughs> horrible. And he was just swamped with people. And I was like, okay, I have to photograph you. Yeah, got it. I had a stormtrooper T-shirt on, so he, as far as we were concerned, we were in sync with each other because we both yeah. So that was good. Um, he came over to the little pop-up studio I created, which was basically shot on a highlight, you know, the last right. one highlight. Um, and then later on in Photoshop, I digitized it and turned it into this effect because um, I thought it needed something a little bit more to it. Um, yeah. And then I sent that to the little lad as a thank you, really. So. Yeah, exactly right. That's a lovely photograph. I love this shot here of this. Uh, I'm assuming this is some form of a geisha girl from... Uh, it is, yeah, Geisha yeah. Girl. And Geisha, rather, yeah. That's one. Um, this was working with a fantastic makeup artist called Sean Chapman. Um, he's doing quite a lot of work with um, Toya Wilcox, actually. Um, he's been oh, on right. the show lately. Um, so he's doing some stuff with her, and he had, I had this idea that I wanted to produce this work, and he was like, oh, okay, I've got a contact. <laughs> very nonchalantly um and it happens to be someone who produces authentic um kimonos um and he said oh and i kind of like the genre in myself and yeah he just blew me away he he knew everything he knew the nuances of how they should act and what they should do and all this makeup that you see there is his work it's not mine the photography and the lighting i can take credit for but that's it yeah um but it was an amazing collaboration i think when you get the right people yeah. Hopefully magic happens. And for me, I had probably a dozen or 15 strong images out of this two hours set. I think we were on it for yeah. um, the face, the face and looks like porcelain. It's a, uh, it was amazing, 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 amazing work, but the makeup took three hours, maybe um, really? did all that out of studio. So we weren't eating studio time, Yeah, um, but getting the geisha from, his location to our location was a challenge, I'll say, yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to the next one. The uh, duster that you've created this, this here. Was, this, is, this is a, it's half genuine and half not. Um, yep. This guy's um, a dancer, um, Louise Young. Um, he came to me and said, I'd like to work with you. You've got some great work. What could we do? And I said, well, I'd like to do a flower shot. I've always had this idea of working with the flower. Um, I've seen it often enough. I just haven't had the right person to work with to get something good. He, as you can clearly see, has a fantastic physique. So, yeah. I thought, okay, we've got to make the most of that. And I did originally have a lot of jumping moves and, and flips and all the rest of it. And whilst they were good, they weren't super strong. You would get half of a flip because obviously you're you're catching this so you get yeah. half of a flip and the dust the flower actually producing an effect but maybe not the effect you wanted and i kind of not struggled but it, it didn't it didn't wow me so i was like okay let's go a bit more static and let's produce something that we can work with so what i got was him doing this pose several times and throwing that out so what you see there is genuine 
but not it, it's been obviously digitized effect into these wings um, but the flower is real it's all there it was all 100% genuine throws out it's just layers of the flower put on and then shaped accordingly so that's what I've done with that yeah great uh, great bit of work at the site at the time and a great bit of editing uh, oh, that, uh, it was a challenge i'll say that which <laughs> yeah but it was i bet it was and the cleanup uh, oh dude yeah i was going to say there must be a mess on the floor there that super was. shot here beautiful work uh, again great makeup I, again, I'd, hate to ask, I'd, hate, I'd hate to ask how long this took um this again was sean um he, he this was one of the first ones i think i did with him um, right that, um, and we started off clean. We have several shots of the, this model um, in different poses using different headgear and whatnot. And then as the shot went along, we got progressively messier and messier. Um, right. Again, you've got quality workmanship, as in his uh, makeup. You've got a fantastic model who knows how to pose. Um, and then hopefully myself, who brings the life and the light to the image. And what's not to like really it's, it's no it's it's, it's 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 a great shot I, I was going to ask you about the lighting here this is something which i don't do so tell us about the actual setup of the lighting for this particular shot if you can uh, remember okay challenge um it would be <laughs> on a black back backdrop seamless um yep. presumably if i look in her eye properly there looks like there's a beauty dish which is up to the right of camera which is why you get a lot of this we we thought it would be wise this is what you learn later on which you didn't know um that if we put some vaseline on her body it'll give her this nice shimmer what yep. he instead was gave her this really bright highlight which is kind of the thing that i don't love so much about the image um but again it's one of the things you don't know at the time you had to we had to make the glitter stick somehow and that seemed like the logical way of doing it yeah live and learn as these things yeah. go um and then there would have been a, a light off to the left to give a bit of rim light which is just catching as you can see her back shoulder and a yeah. little bit of a hand and a hair um it did need a hair light which isn't there um but again it's one of them things that as you're shooting you get caught up and you don't always notice things that you do in post and you think ah yeah I? but this is this is the learning curve that comes from it and again that's right I try, I don't know if you noticed, but in each of my shots, I try to vary it. I try to do things differently. I use different lighting techniques. I use different lighting setups because I don't want my work to be formulaic. I want it to have a style and a look, and I think I have that now. Um, I definitely yeah. have that, but I think now having such a body of work, I can actually look at it and say, oh, yeah, okay, I can see similarities in my work, which I would put down to being a style. Um, but in terms of lighting, I do try to vary it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, that's interesting what you say about the uh, the lighting aspects there. It's some, I haven't done any studio work at all before. It's, uh, I must tr give it a try sometime. I prefer studio. I'm, yeah. I'm so much happier in a studio because I can control each of the aspects. And I, I'm, I'm not a control freak, but I enjoy having that control. Yeah. How was the hair basically uh, created here? Is this uh, a simple fan at the back or has this, it been? Yeah, this is literally, well, it wasn't a fan. <laughs> it wasn't a fan. It was actually the hairdresser, Raf. He was behind her. And we tried to find the biggest thing we could find in his, this was shot in his salon. Uh, yeah. Tried to find the biggest thing we could, which happened to be LPs. Um, so oh, right. LPs flapping the hair up. Behind. Flapping the hair. And this is how we created this. It's, you know, interesting you say that. I don't know if you've seen, um, there's been some videos which I came across on YouTube just recently with uh, Rankin. Okay. And he did the he did the image, uh, which is uh, infamous with uh, David Bailey, where he took the photograph of Gene Shrimpton. And uh, it was the one where the, the blonde hair is just wafting in the breeze. And and uh, Rankin said to David Bailey, who was actually standing next to him, imagine that, taking a photograph, you're copying someone, and, and the actual photographer's standing there watching you do it. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, he said, how did you do it, David? So he said, well, I just had a guy standing off, off camera with a, with a big white board, a bit like this, and he wafted the hair, and his hair just took off, and he went, wow, do it again. And it was just amazing. <laughs> so there you go, simple little LP record behind to get that hair yeah, that was exploding it. like that behind her. Fantastic. That was the thing. We, we had a lot of shots, and they were all very pretty, but they weren't dynamic. Yeah. I said, I need something a bit more. Yeah. 
oomph, but I didn't want the model to be moving because of facial expression. Yeah, you wanted it, yeah. Static. So it was then getting the hair, the hair had to come alive. And just by resting it on her shoulders and then wafting, let it lift up. And that's how you create this effect. So. Brilliant. No super, no super glue involved then? No. no. <laughs> Back to the geisha girl. She is there. As I say, I have plenty of these shots. So yeah. Yeah. Authentic Japanese samurai sword. Thank yeah, you. I was going to say, I wouldn't argue with her on a, on a dark yeah. night. That was the lady with yeah. the glitter. Right, okay. Yeah, so obviously you recognise the, the uh, tattoos. Yeah. Bit of hair styling. That is, that was again for Raph. He, um, this is the lady who actually was the geisha, but this is a shot uh, three months prior where I first met her and we discussed this idea of the the geisha um she was there having her hair done and he'd done this if you can see that little bluey greeny tint at the end he was yeah. kind of working yeah. with that so again we wanted to emphasize the great hair and she did have amazingly long hair mm -hmm. but when you photograph the hair it was just like okay so it's hair there wasn't much to it so i had her lay down on the floor i put yeah. a um it was a large laster light uh, pop-up reflector behind her so she lay on that and then just sculpted the hair into this shape and this is what you see before you so again no real magic it's no the right people and the right creative thinking creates strong images it's one of those images when you look at it and you go how the blazes have you done that but then of course you think it well uh, yeah i can now see she is lying down on her back and she's posing in one particular direction and of course the hair has been fashioned into that shape that tear shape yeah apostrophe shape almost really lovely yeah. you like it yes uh this fella i think should be playing uh, rugby tonight but he obviously wasn't chosen no robin's a good guy very strong character and he, he suits this genre he, he does a yeah. lot of um, acting work um back in the extras and whatnot. And this idea for this was actually from Glyn Dewis. He'd done um, the Brunizer yes. method. Yes. Um, so what it is basically is you focus on one point, which in this case is the eyes. So you zoom in, you get a nice focus point on the eyes and you don't change your focal point, but I've got a really tight um, crop in on the eyes. Then I move my camera to the side, take a shot, take a shot take a shot, take a shot, take a shot, take a shot. Take. And I basically produced 12 images, which you then stitch together, which is pretty much uh, right. a medium format style image. So what you get is this very shallow depth of field, which is like a razor's edge. As you can see, his kind yes. of beard's disappearing at, at one point there. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. so far back. Um, and yet his eyes are still pin sharp. Um, and that was a great technique. It was it was frightening. We'd done the whole shot, and I said, I've got this idea that I've seen another photographer do, which he put out there. I haven't stole it. Um, but he no, put no. this idea out there, and I was like, I want to try it, because I think you're the right person for it. But you need to be absolutely static. You cannot even breathe. You just hold yourself. And then I shot this thing in 12 stages, stitched it together in Photoshop, and this is the yeah. And I, I really like it because it's different. Interesting yeah. work. In, yeah, this is different. It's interesting work. What's the name of that photographer again? Is it, is it Drake? Drake again? I've forgotten his name. He's he's, he's got an amazing website. I know. And I do remember watching that video uh, done by Glenn with regards to producing uh, producing that work and and how uh, how you can do uh, some uh, editing to to get close to it. But that's a great shot. I love that and the way you've worked it out. Super. Moving on. Straight model shot. Straightforward, yeah. Yeah. And shoulders. It's a shoulders. hair product. And then uh, Johnny Depp lookalike, which this guy was fantastic. Again, he's yeah. one of these. I have 20, 30 strong images that I put out there to the world, and yeah, it was amazing to work with. He actually was Johnny Depp's double in Pirates of the Caribbean three or four. I was he really? He was the one that was shot in Portsmouth. He went down to be his double. Ah, uh, right, okay. Um, he said it was comically. It was cheaper to have him there to do the little bit of extras than it was to get Johnny Depp to reshoot them. It <laughs> kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, well, but yeah, he, he yeah. was. He was a fantastic character to photograph, um, and I, I did. I had a lot of enjoyment with him. And this shot in particular, I think, has something like four thousand views. It's or likes. Well, he's quite honest with you. It, 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 well, it is. It's, it's Jack Sparrow. He's, uh, yeah, exactly. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. 
Yeah, we're getting a bit of arty work in here. Yeah, I went and for something is... a little different. Um, I yeah. got a makeup artist. And I said I want to create something a bit stronger and bolder. Um, I have a lot of darker images in my work, and I want something really poppy and colourful, something quite graphic on the face. Yeah. Uh, what can you do? So we sat down, and she produced this work. Um, we had a, a wig, and as I said, we worked on the style of the makeup, um, played with the background, threw some gels in to see what we could create, and that's kind of the result. Yeah. How? What, what sort of period of time were you working on that particular sh uh, sitting then? Um. I typically, I try to do my shooting in about an hour. I, I think people get tired quickly and they don't give you your all. And it yeah. takes maybe 20 minutes for you to get in sync with your model anyway because um, you need to warm up, they need to warm up, you need to get into sync with each other. And I think if you can bring out real character or expression within them, that's kind of when you know you're getting good stuff. Yeah. And I know when I've got there because I can normally tell that I've shot this series and then I've suddenly changed the lighting setup so I can almost just go to that last image because I know I got it at that point. Yeah. And that's when I can stop. Yeah. I think we'll finish on this one, Dave, before we uh, come out of the share, uh, out of the screen share. Okay. And, uh, again, this is uh, some heavy artwork done here. Is, how much, how much of this is additional work to the actual makeup? <laughs> it looks to me as though those roses were added at a later stage. Yeah. Oh, no, the roses were genuine. No, really? Yeah, the roses are genuine. I've oh, no, there you go. Totally digitally wrong. enhanced the makeup. Um, I dropped the background in. The blue that you see there was genuine. I put a gel up and I photographed that. Um, the makeup, it has, as I say, it had a little bit of tweaking to it. The roses were genuinely there. The rest was there. The eyelashes were there. Um, all I've done is later in post enhanced certain things, manipulated a couple of things to improve them a little bit where it wasn't quite symmetrical. This image, as you can tell, it, the symmetry was kind of paramount. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so some things needed a bit of finessing, um, but pretty much what you see there is what was created. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to get to the one where after we, uh, we spoke uh, about uh, you coming on the show, uh, it was this one. Yeah. And I remember the infamous Zacharias talking about this image. And uh, yeah. is this the one? Is this the one which was just slightly? It, it is here. Is it? Was it more off balance that he was talking about in his Correct. review of your? I, I've, yeah. I've corrected it since. Yes. Yes. I, I, again, I, I put a thing out. Can can we talk about the Zach thing? Yeah, of course. Go go ahead. I, I don't think um, he's going to complain. I think no. I think most people know who Zacharias is. Exactly, yeah. And I, I asked my peers in, in, in Brighton um, for some critique on my work and some genuine feedback because I genuinely needed it. Yeah. And they all said very nice things. They all said, no, oh, it's very pretty and this is very good. And, oh, it's amazing. Oh, I wish I could do this. So, okay. They're all very nice things to hear, but they're not helping me. I, exactly I need, right. I need something a bit more straightforward oh. and cutting maybe yeah. so um zach had rebranded himself and put this thing out there i'm looking to critique websites i just rebranded my website from chrysalis photography to day freeman my own name a yeah. whole new thing i would now gone to squarespace instead of wordpress i put up all my best and my best images and was very proud of them so i figured what's the worst that can happen <laughs> exactly right and then zach happened <laughs> um, and, and you can still find that YouTube video. Um, I yeah. think at the moment I've only been the only website that's been critiqued, um, and, and you'll see why. Um, but he, he literally tore my work apart in a nice way and in a constructive way, but also in a typically Zach Arias kind of way. There was a few bits yeah. involved. I, I think I think I'm going to come out of screen share because uh, this is an interesting aspect you're talking about here about critique, getting critique from your family they're never going to say anything bad about everyone's work they're my not. mother thought my mother thought i was the best photographer in the world you know and that no one was ever going to argue against that and but you do have to have at the end of the day especially if you're going to be go down the professional route you do need someone to give it to you straight you do that's good that's crap let's move on and 
I did watch that uh, Zach big uh, video when it first came out because it just moved to Dead Pixel, a new new brand. Right. And I remember you, in actual fact, uh, on uh, Ready Steady Pro, saying, "What do you think about the logo?" And that stuff, which was which was nice sort of input that you were getting from people from that group. And I remember watching it, and I thought, "Wow, this this works pretty damn good." I didn't relate the name at the time until later, um, and. Of course, if it's got this thing where he and his wife are commenting. Now, let's put this into perspective. His wife, can I use the term, knows about photography. Yeah. But Zach, Zach has the knowledge of photography. Correct. And yeah. there's, a difference, there's a difference there. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously his wife's going to say, yeah, I like that image. So I think it's going, yeah, I like the muscles on that guy's face, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, blah. Where Zach will turn around and say immediately, that's out of balance. That's not right there. He hasn't got the lighting right there. And that's what you need. Oh, exactly. And he was spot on. And um, he was. He, he was able to see stuff, and particularly on that particular shot, which he loved. Um, but he was like, yes. it, it's off on the side. Yes. And I had to actually put it into Photoshop to look at it and go, oh, yes, yes. So it is, because I just didn't see it. Um, no. And it's I've, I've seen exactly the same thing and a, and a, a similar thing. I went along to a Royal Photographic uh, uh uh, what do you call it um assessment of work and the guy stood up and he'd, he'd taken a photograph of of a building and he said and it was a straight on shot there was no what term dutch angle nothing at all and he said take this image away it's not level and the guy screamed at him from the back of the room saying it is level i've checked it. he said i'm telling you it's not it's two degrees out and of course he was right he could see it and it, it's when you have a professional eye um that either judges on a regular basis or is in the field that they can see the things which obviously we get so attached to images don't we we and do we this is part of my problem and and we're also limited by our own knowledge I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm only as good as what i know um exactly. i'm self-taught i've been doing this as i say this is my fifth year in um and i don't i don't know everything oh you've got no. some, oh, there you are um <laughs> i don't know <laughs> everything <laughs> <laughs> sorry i'm boring you there no no but I don't know everything, and I am limited by what I know and what I don't know. So I can only produce work to a certain standard. And in order yes. to progress, I need somebody else to either show me how to do that or to give me the bit of information that I'm missing. Um, yeah. Putting myself out there to Zach, I really did get uh, torn apart, shall we say politely. You, you, um, you, got, you got the, um, dare I use the term, you, you got the... Um... You got you you got the full full whack. He praised you where your work was good, correct. But at the which was really really nice. Yeah. But at the same time, he said no. Uh, actually, I think he still got one on the website, which in actual fact, which was the Indian one, yeah. which is the, uh, the he, he didn't. Uh, if my memory serves me correct. He didn't particularly like that style. No, he didn't he like thought, that. He didn't like the shot of my daughter the, in the poppy fields. Yes, that's right. But at the end of the day, then they're my images. Exactly. And you, in, the, in the end of the day, you take critique so far, and yeah. you make your own decisions. You don't take it personally. And every every judge, every critique that I've seen and, and spoken to, listen, photography, like all art, is subjective. This is my opinion. Yeah. Don't take it personally. But if you can, learn from what I have to say. Yeah. And I think that's a very that's a very important point. But I, I, I was a because we were talking just before the show, and I, I thought, I've seen this guy's, this guy's work somewhere before, and I thought it was through the Arcanum because we'd spoken about the Arcanum on the walkabout with uh, with Alex, yeah. and I couldn't find it anywhere. And then suddenly I remembered when I went onto your website and saw this fellow, I went, Zach Arias. I remember the comments being made. and Well, full, full marks to you putting your work out there because I would not have – the front, the balls. <laughs> I'm going to say yeah. balls. I don't my realize what's was coming. Coming. I might not have to. No. <laughs> he did do a couple of more of, of videos of websites. I haven't seen any since. I haven't. You you, you go into Dead Pixel and you go you YouTube and uh, uh, do a Dead Pixel search. There are others, okay. and uh, they pretty got me exactly the same treatment. So don't oh, think no. that you're really different. Or no, you, I you don't think I'm special. <laughs> Have you? Because he's been over a couple of times. Have you ever had a chance to meet him at all? I actually haven't. He is one of my idols, um, for want of a better word. Um, but our journey um, is very similar. We were, were both at certain points, and I'm probably where he was when he was on the verge of 
quitting and giving it all up and what exactly like, yeah ah, yeah I, i'm there so often it's just like, oh. I'd, lo I'd love him i've sent sent him a couple of emails i'd love him to come on my show and have a chat about that but he hasn't replied yet but i will keep trying because he hasn't he said no great. yet the minute, the minute the minute the, the minute the invitation goes out and someone says no no thank you then i leave it but if i don't get any answer i just keep as asking and asking until i do get the no but then i'm encouraged by the no because i know the next one's going to be a yes but uh, no, Zach Arias, in actual fact, there's three people. We're going to talk about Fuji now. There's three people that I blame for me using Fuji cameras now. Zach Arias, David Hobby, and Damien Lovegrove. Damien Lovegrove persuaded me in his videos with regards to the X-T10. And uh, <clears throat> Dave Hobby and Zach Arias are responsible for me getting the X-100S and the, uh, the X-E1. So bringing that very neatly round to Fuji. You did almost you, seamlessly. <laughs> it, 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 uh, seamless. You see, I'm good at this. Um, Canon is be, was is your mainstay camera for your studio work. You've, you've yeah. said that before the show, but you're now finding that maybe the Fuji cameras are starting to eke into your into your workflow. How did you come about the, the Fujis in the first place? Well, I, I I've invested heavily in Canon. Um, yep. I have all the lenses to do the work I need. Um, so it is very much a workhorse. It's the Mark II, nothing flash. It's, it's just the camera that works for me. Um, and after a wedding, my arms genuinely, I'm just like, wow, okay, I'm getting old. Yeah. Uh, they, they just, they kill. When you're carrying a, around your Mark II and your 7200 and your gear and, and, and it just, it eats away at you during the day. And you don't realize because you're working on adrenaline. That's exactly right, yeah. But afterwards, you actually do. On the train back home or the next day, it, you, you really do feel the fatigue on your body. Um, so I was like, I'm, I'm not happy with this. I, I want to go on to other systems. And I wasn't happy with Canon per se because they did this thing where they, in my opinion, I'll put it out there, in my opinion, yep. Canon kind of forgot about their end user. They decided to chase other things. They pulled out trade shows. They stopped looking after the people. They stopped producing yep. firmware. And I'm like, guys, why are you doing this? I'm using you. I've invested in you, and I want more from you. Yeah. Basically saying, yeah, I'm, I'm done. And that irks me a little bit. And I saw all this mirrorless stuff coming out, and I was like, that's interesting. It's light, yep. it's quicker. They're producing ambassadors for the cameras to go out. And I was like, I could do that. There's, there's no reason I couldn't. So I had a look at who was doing things. And for me, it was people like Zach Arias. He was doing yep. some nice stuff. Kevin Mullins was doing some amazing wedding photography. Superb wedding photography, like, yeah. It's a very different style to how I typically shoot, but I liked it. And I was like, maybe that's a, a way I could get back into it and find a bit more of an interest for it. Um, so I had a look at the fuji range that was first out initially and it was yeah. the x100 and various iterations um and i didn't want to invest heavily in another system and to be fair i couldn't afford to so yeah. i had to make my choices wisely so my decision which was quite a canny one i think was to turn around and say right i'm going to put it out there to whoever is, is around the spheres that i want to do a face off your camera versus mine we'll go out for a day and we'll photograph we'll do like street photography because it's simple it's there. sure yeah um but i'll pick my camera against yours and see what we do and i put it out to fuji olympus sony whoever happened to be around and wanted to do it and i got several people take me up on it and it was good because i would get to have their camera and i get to practice with it and see what i liked about it see what i didn't like about it and see where it worked or where it didn't work for me um, and I tried the Olympus stuff, and it just didn't gel. There's something about it. I don't know what it is. It just didn't gel for me. And I tried various versions of the Fuji, and it was gelling a little bit more, but I was like, if only it did, if only we could, oh, if, oh, and it was so close to being where it, where it needed to be. Um, and then I went out about, right, a couple of months ago now, four or five months ago, um, I went off to park cameras and there was yep. a guy there and I really forgive the guy's name, but he totally convinced me that that camera would work for my portraiture work because he was there photographing a great model. Um, she had this fantastic makeup, that just basically the powder had just been poured on her face. And when he zoomed in, you could see every little nuance of the powder. And I was like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. On top of that, 
he was also about two foot closer than I could get with my cannon. And I was like, huh, that's yeah. interesting. And I had a look at his gear. And again, they, they, because it was a Fuji day, they let us try it. And I was like, okay, I really like this. I'm convinced. This is the camera. I like the feel of it. And it was the X-T1. X-T1, yeah. Um, yeah. And I said, okay, here's the deal, guys. If you can get me this camera with this lens and this lens right now, I'll buy it. But I want it right now because I'm about to walk out of the shop. And I had – this was just before I photographed the Geisha. And I said, if it's good enough and it works properly, I'll use the, cam I'll use the camera on the Geisha girl. Yeah. Um, and the guy who was there, again, I, I'm bad with names. Um, he turned around and he busted a nut to make sure that park cameras got me everything I wanted and then went above. He then got me a, um, he got me a discount on it. He threw in a card. He threw in a battery. It just, every, he was just like, dum, 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 dum. So I was like, okay, I can't say no now because this no, is don't deal. above and beyond. Don't deal. Um, so I invested and I got the camera back and I did shoot the Geisha with it. I did the behind the scenes stuff with the Fuji rather than the main stuff again. I literally had it half an hour before the shoot. I didn't know yeah. it perfectly, but I was still able to produce good images, which was yeah. interesting. And it was not rewarding, rewarding's not the word, but it, it, it kind of relaxed me into thinking I've made the right decision. Yeah. The Fuji X-T1 for me, I've used it a lot more since, and it just works. It's an yeah. amazing camera. It's light compared to my Canon. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just solid. I, I actually can't. I, I looked through it and I was like, okay, there's a couple of niggles that I'd like fixed about it and I'd like a touch screen and so on and so forth. But they really yeah. are finite niggles compared yeah. to Canon where I'm saying, okay, I have this issue and you're not going to support it no more. So, well, you, you in actual fact, I remember that show in, uh, in Birmingham because I'm in the exhibition industry myself. So I'd see these little notes coming through and it was like a bombshell. I think it was literally about two, maybe three weeks before the NEC show, the imaging show up in uh, uh, Birmingham there. Yeah. Canon are pulling out. And I, I just, I thought three weeks before the show, this is just crazy. And I went to the show and it was just an empty open space where they decided to put some sort of cafe open area. Yeah. And of course, Nikon were all over the show completely. They were they filled the place completely. But of course, what has happened now down the line? The innovations are coming from the mirrorless cameras. There's just no doubt about it. And I've, I've said this many times on my show before. I was at a presentation of Sony cameras four or five years ago when they bought out the NEX7 and the translucent SLR camera. And I remember the guy turning around and saying, "In four five years time, we are going to be number one." We have set a goal. A goal. We are going to be number one in 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 the uh, in the in the camera market, and of course, you you you've got a vibe. You think, yeah, really. You know, they're not going to knock Nikon and Canon off the slot, but they have because the oh, yeah. Sony A7s are a fantastic camera. It's not my style of camera. I would hasten to add because I don't think they've got the lens stable yet. Um, and I switched to Fuji because again, all my Nikon gear was far too heavy for me to carry. And when I'm I'm basically uh, on business trips and stuff like that, I do my street photography. I don't want to be carrying a low pro bag around of just in case gear. And the at the time the Fuji XE one, one suited me down to the ground. So I can I know exactly where you're coming from. In regards to the image quality, I have not seen any difference in image quality at all. No. And it has been said to me by Canon users, full frame Canon users, that they haven't seen any difference in the quality of image. With a one and a half crop X trans sensor or the Canon full frame or even Nikon 810s. Now, I went out and I did a comparison, um, set up a tripod, shot on my Canon and yeah. shot on the Fuji. And I looked at them and I was like, okay, there's minutia bits of thing. And it tends yeah. to be the depth of field, in truth. That tends to be the yeah. only um, On a Canon, it's slightly more blurry, it's slightly more beautiful bokeh effect. Um, the depth is a little bit better. But when you consider that you're able to drop to 1.4, which is effectively giving you the 2.2.2 range, who cares? It's still better than my 2.8 anyway. Um, yeah. I'm still able to shoot in low light. I'm still able to produce work at high ISOs, which was still working. Yeah. Um, and it's lighter and it's simpler and, 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 and. And the lenses, the lenses are cheaper. 
They are the lenses oh, are cheaper, and in actual fact, they are amazing. I bought the kit lens with my XE1, and I tell you, I keep on saying to everyone, please don't call it a kit lens. It is not a kit lens. It is I, super. I don't have a kit lens. Uh, I went out and I said, I need, I need it to be comparable. Yes. If if I'm working and I'm producing the work that I'm doing, it needs to be at least on par. There's no point in taking that step back. So the no, quite agree with you. Same. Especially okay. if you're following through in a professional career, exactly. there's no point stepping back. The only person who who has come up with with in my book a a, a a decent argument to the switch from a DSLR to mirrorless, mirrorless camera is Martin Bailey, where he's got so much invested in his Canon gear, and they are big lenses. You're yeah. talking 100, 400 uh, zoom lenses with four times converters, all sorts of. Things. He's invested so deeply into that that gear. That he really to probably for the next ten years he will stay with Canon because of that investment. But well, there is the, the other thing, the, the lenses that they make. You you need the zoom focuses. You need the speed to be there. You yes. Need, um, for example, the tilt shift. You can jimmy stuff and make it work, but I, I don't want to. If I'm investing in a system, I want them to have the range of gear that I need in order to yeah. do the jobs I do, which is why I've held on to the Canon, which is why it does the job it does. Um, yeah. I have the nice wide angle for that, which I don't have with the Fuji. So again, there's certain times when the Canon will naturally be pulled out versus the Fuji. But for the most part, I now walk around town, do some street stuff. It's always with the Fuji. I don't take the Canon yeah. out. And no, I don't take the Canon out. It's uh, remarkable what Fuji have done. Uh, it's uh, it is my choice of camera, uh, and uh, I haven't really anyone I've spoken to heard anyone make a bad comment about the system. I, I say as a system, Dave, you come to that time in the show where all all my guests go, oh, not that question. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <You're critiquing laughs> <them? No. laughs> Who would you say has been your inspiration in photography? Um, again, um, I, I've kind of had that baptism of fire that four years in, I don't have this backlogged history. Um, but the photographer that sticks in mind for me, um, for my inspiration would be someone like Richard Avedon. Yes. I think watching, I watched a video of him work and he was just so lively. He was so energetic. He was so enthusiastic about what he was producing and he produced some strong portraiture and amazing uh, Portrait is where I, I do most of my work. And to look at the images that he produces is just phenomenal. So yeah. for me, I think Avedon, there, there's a whole raft of there's things. There's loads, there's loads. I tell you, interesting you mentioned him, actually, because, again, Rankin did the copy. Uh, Rankin did the copy of the uh, the model with the elephants. Okay. And, uh, it, so that was, uh, that was an intrigue. So great choice of your inspiration. So question is, if you've got one, you don't have to have one, but if you've got one, who's your favourite photographer at this time? Because I think it always changes. Well, it does. And and you just mentioned Rankin is my other. Um, I, I wanted to see him, and when he did that TV show recently. Yes. This uh, is the, the, I applied yeah. for that because to have Rankin as a mentor, seriously, yeah. how amazing would that be? Um, but he does produce amazing work and provocative and interesting and it's quite engaging whether you like it or not you're, you're engaged with it um, yes I, I do like him for that reason and I, I like him as a character I think he's yes got, he's definitely got a character definitely that kind of wise guy kind of thing about him which I kind of like um, yeah. but yeah ranking would be my my kind of go-to Zacharias um, the, 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 there's there's a whole range there's a whole range of them you're quite right you're quite right interestingly now i keep saying about this particular show that ranking was on david bailey was standing off camera and while he was taking the photograph with a roly flex because he wanted to film this photograph said he's good isn't he <laughs> <laughs> which i thought was just a brilliant comment dave thank you so much for joining me today it's been a great conversation about a fairly short brief career here and all power to you let's let's hope your career goes onward and upward from here I hope so, thank you. superb and uh congratulations as well getting your getting your portfolio looked at by zach arias and and taking that one on the chin as well, well for that if you watch the video you'll see the progression and you'll see it in yeah I, I well i i definitely can without a shadow of doubt and uh hopefully uh the viewers that are watching today will go on to dave freeman uh let me just check it. it's dave freeman.com 
you go on there and have a good look. But I will be putting all the links to, uh, to date on, on the blog, as I usually do. Uh, the Twitter links, the Facebook links, Google Plus, yeah, and and LinkedIn, and all those. Put that on there for you to to track him down, and who knows, better luck he might give him some work as well. So, thank you so much for joining me, Dave. I really appreciate it. And, and it suffice for me to say, I know it's Thursday. We've got one day to go to the weekend. If you are going out shooting this weekend, please, please, please leave your camera bag at home. All the best, to you. Bye for now. <laughs> We're still live. No, we're gone. We're gone. No, we, we are still live. Actually, we are still live. <laughs> I can't. I can't cut it. Stop the broadcast.